I have pretty hardcore keynote today for you guys to talk about evolution of binary program analysis and approaches in the era of artificial intelligence. How basically we've been doing uh, binary program analysis in the past, how we do it now, and what we need to change to make it more effective and robust. I'm Alex Matrosov and uh, uh, my first time when I opened IDA Pro, it's been something around 1995, so quite a while ago. And uh, so basically, I'm a founder uh, of BinaryLink, and also I'm doing 20 plus years of cybersecurity research in different fields. I've been working for the companies like Intel Corporation and NVIDIA, so we just caused some breaks on CPU, <laughs> CPUs and GPUs. So also, I, I love surfing, it's why I moved to the Southern California. And um, reverse engineering actually complement all my professional background in many cases, even the building I'm living in, it's called the IRE. So it's not a joke, it's real. <laughs> and I not pick this building because of the name. <laughs> so, and um, this talk, it's intended to cover uh, the history going through my personal experience, right? So I don't uh, intended to cover the complete history of reverse engineering and binary program analysis. It's more about my personal experience and the things I can see and how we can do it better. So it's some of the disclaimer. And um, one of uh, the things I really want to set from the beginning, it is about the disconnection about the industry and the academia world. And basically the difference between the goals are set uh, between different groups of the researchers in academia and the industry. And uh, basically it's not many intersection between these research purposes. And uh, I really want to see maybe my talk and uh, maybe in future, this research will be more connected. It will be solving more problems uh, in the real world and actually in a way in the industry for the best. But before we dive deeper, um, actually I want to talk about what this actually reverse engineering and binary program analysis is, right? So I really believe it's all about understanding and finding the right mindset uh, how this program been built and learn from it. I take this picture in one of the galleries in Los Angeles last weekend and this is a very complex piece of art, right? And um, somehow it's resonated in my mind about every program it's actually contain a lot of dependencies. Every program contain a lot of things which is unknown for the person who opened it in this assembly or any other tools to understand that how it is operate and how this works, right? Same thing about the piece of the art. You don't know what it's been in mind of an artist when he been painting this piece of art, right? And you try to understand, you try to create in hypothesis, you try to get to the right mindset to understand what this is, right? Same thing about reverse engineering the program. Basically, it's state of the art, it's been state of the art in, in the past, it's still uh, state of the art in nowadays. Um, basically, in the past, it's been very lack of knowledge and knowledge base about how to use the tooling and actually lack of the tooling itself, right? But uh, we developed more tools, but basically a lot of, of these tools are disconnected. How we can complement uh, the output from the different tools or results from the different tools, how we can make it more effective and robust. This is exactly about how principles of the program analysis are work. And actually, I been the first of my experience, it's been around actually um, playing with DRS in the uh, 90s. And uh, I didn't use actually a lot of uh, the context when I've been later on studying in university is actually being written in this brilliant book uh, called Principles of the Program Analysis by Fleming Nelson. Of course, this book actually very hard to read, I would admit, but uh, actually it's the mindset being created way earlier. Nowadays, we have a lot of uh, knowledge base built around the program analysis and a lot of theories, abstractions, which is, can be used more effectively. But again, 
it's everything about the mindset. We really need to focus on where our mind is at, right? And uh, I pick this uh, quote from Kelly Slater, one of the surfers, uh, famous surfers from Southern California. And he's uh, actually talking about the mind where you want to stand on the way, if you really need to focus. Same thing about the program analysis. When you want to reverse engineer the program, you need to really focus and understand uh, about what this program is does, to create the hypothesis and set your mind in the right way. And uh, in reverse engineering and program analysis, we have uh, two major drivers from the industry. One of these, it's malware analysis, and another one is vulnerability research, right? And basically, uh, it's pretty much visible, even from the workshop uh, today, a lot of topics is innate in these two uh, different categories, right? And um, malware analysis is actually focused more about code explainability to understand the code and uh, uh, behavioral and uh, uh, context of this code, how it is executed and uh, what kind of behavior it is malicious or suspicious, or maybe this is a legit program. And vulnerability research, in many cases, about uh, code coverage to understand completeness about uh, the code and uh, researching of this code. As example, a lot of things we can't get only from the static analysis and uh, Basically, we need a dynamic uh, tooling which will be complement our static analysis for vulnerability research because we're missing some context, right? And um, as example, earlier today at the morning, it's been a talk about uh, finding the root of cause of the crash analysis, right? And um, basically, it's exactly where we need the context to understand why it happened, but also what is also important, it's focus uh, what happened, how important it is to fix it and prioritize such fixes. So, but let's come back um, in early 2000. So this is a photo of my uh, previous uh, uh, employer uh, called ESA. So it's a virus lab. Um, it's something in 2006, 2007. So basically all uh, detections being developed manually, mainly manually, right? So of course, it's cool, but people don't scale, right? So we need to develop better uh, tooling for actually automate the work like that. And it's been a lot of work uh, focused on a few different categories. One of them is understanding unknown structured formats. And uh, basically this screenshot uh, is a hidden file system from one of the most complicated boot kits uh, I reverse engineered code gaps uh, in 2012, but basically everything on the anti-malware lab at the time has been focused for developing the detections. So, but how you can develop? Of course, heuristics and signature-based automation helps. Uh, this tool we developed for uh, detecting the hidden file systems. But the same approaches is actually can apply for undocumented structured formats as well. This screenshot from my research from 2017 when I've been researching um, Woodguard K manifest. And uh, this is uh, very interesting, but the structured format actually can be automated with detection, can be automated with machine learning, right? Because if you understand at least it has specific structure contain different nature of the data, which is can be classified by entropy models. You can do this with uh, uh, literally machine learning model, uh, learning from some entropy feature based. And this classification already happens, right? Another thing, it is automated detection and signature generation, right? Uh, such things, it's been developed. I think it's a lot of open source tooling. Even Google create one called BXSIG, when you can generate automatically um, the Yara rules for the detections. But the problem is uh, signature generation. It's not 
equal to signature optimization because, of course, with exponential growth of the samples, you will have exponential growth of the failures. So basically, when you have the growth of the number, malware samples or these samples are more diverse and not really connected to one single family, you basically grow your size of the detection sequence, basically signature or pattern or MESP or whatever regular expression being created. In the same time, it's not effective. It's raised significant number of the false positives or negatives, depends on the context. But basically, um, answering the question, can we really automate all the signature generation for the industry? I think uh, it's still an open question because some of the things can be automated, some it's hard to automate, but the quality of uh, the results, it's questionable. Um, after um, some of the works in like uh, something 2007, eight, uh, about like how we can automate uh, generation of the signature detections um, start pumping up. So a lot of different companies start creating the simple concept of just detecting files based on entropy. When, as example, you have the compressed file uh, with some packer, it will be cause some anomaly. Uh, this works, but also the race of the false positives and the problems for the industry has been more significant than the problems they are being solving because every single uh, file which is just compressed will be detected as a malicious, right? Um, I remember, I will not say the name of uh, endpoint product, but it's used only machine learning at the time. Uh, like it's been always triggering events on my hex race decompiler and it's caused like a disaster because I need to go to IT security and unblock my uh, hex race decompiler to continue my work. So this is exactly the false positives which is caused actually cost actually come to money because I can't work about one or two hours it depends on the uh, when, of the time of the response from my IT security. But anyway, signature mainly it's been sequence of the byte, right? So it's missed the code of like code semantics and explainability, right? So we not have any metadata from the code on size byte sequences. Actually, it resonates with the same way how we try to train the first machine learning models to detect in the code, right? As in to that, no semantics, it's just a byte sequence based vectors same code to back uh, or like a word to back, all these variations doesn't contain any sort of semantics. And uh, the detection of anomaly, it's not explainable. Another thing which actually been very useful uh, during my career when we get all this graph representation implemented in IDA Pro. So basically it's been uh, why I'm talking about IDA Pro a lot, because it's been my main tool during my cool reverse engineering career. And I still believe it's one of the most useful tools for reverse engineering ever been created and you can buy from the shelf. So basically on this screen, you can see the call graph on the left side, um, on the right side probably uh, from you. But anyway, so this uh, call graph it's representing some context because the functions has been renamed, right? It's exactly the metadata. But think about if we remove all the names, this graph representation will be have completely different meaning, right? So it will be no entry point, it will be no dependencies with the meaningful names of the functions. It's how metadata is important for the analysis, but in the same way, the same metadata, it's super important for actually training the models and developing the detection, finding the vulnerabilities, etc. But um, what if we can actually reproduce the graph, but this graph, it will be super complex like a C++ code. And um, um, this is a copy of the slide from the presentation at Ericon in 2013 when the bootkit, which as I already mentioned, gaps uh, actually developed on C++. 
And to reverse engineer such complex bootkit, we need specific way to automate the C++ code reconstruction. Of course, you can do it manually, but it's not fun to go and uh, find all the related virtual functions. It's not fun to actually construct all this compiler um, optimizations over the C++ code. And um, basically, uh, this has been a problem in early 2000s. This has been a problem in 2013. And C++ code is still uh, the big problem to reconstruct. And why? Mainly because uh, complexity of abstractions in C++ code is growing with every, every year, actually, uh, adding more and more complex abstractions to develop more complex programs and uh, basically make it more simplified on architectural way, but at the same time, it's creating more complex compiler idioms and constraints. So, uh, but uh, one of the insightful things uh, I learned that it's about intermediate representations. And I think like uh, uh, Halberflake, Thomas Dulian, and uh, Dynamics, it's actually been developing very useful concept. Of course, it's been at the beginning having a lot of corner cases. For example, floating point, it's been always a problem for rail. It's been not catered for that. But what if we can convert and transform the assembly language on something more suitable for the analysis. Because we can decompile every program in many cases if it is actually have some broken dependencies or disassembly is incorrect, right? And then uh, Hexray has been uh, opening their interface to their high-level intermediate representation called C-Tree. And uh, this is strikes uh, in my mind about like, wow, if you look on these C trees, we can actually find some additional metadata. Um, and this metadata can be useful to reconstruct actually uh, virtual table pointers and uh, find them more effectively automatically. And this is exactly uh, how the first concept of the plugin called Hexrace Code Explorer came up in my mind uh, to actually develop this automation for reconstructing this complex uh, bootkit. But um, later on, it actually became more uh, useful also to reconstruct the complex types in general, because as you can see um, from the intermediate representation, you can find, as example, pointer structure and the size of this object. Uh, so basically, it's more um, robust to reconstruct from intermediate representation such complex objects than from assembly language, because basically you need to reconstruct more con con context which is already exist on intermediate representation. So I think uh, intermediate representations, it's one of the most useful concepts when we change an abstraction layer and look from the different perspective on assembly code. Um, of course, Gidra P code uh, is um, very uh, suitable for reverse engineering because it's actually providing a lot of contextual data. As example, slate format already supporting a lot of different architectures. And of course, uh, the ways to argument your analysis uh, on uh, 40 different architectures, it's amazing, like hex rays. Uh, don't have it, and uh, I would say hex trace when they didn't develop in their intermediate representation format, it's more been focused on uh, decompiling the code. And I don't really believe they've been uh, thinking open at uh, an early beginning. So basically, they open it later on, but it's not being developed to actually uh, for building on top of it automations and. Uh, other stuff. That's why um, I think uh, PCOT has a lot of benefits. And another one, binary needs, actually they came up to the party later on, but it's been actually benefit their approach of um, 
develop an intermediate representation and actually different abstraction of this intermediate uh, representation has more high level, more low level. It depends on the metadata you need to extract and what kind of, what type of analysis you wanted to perform. So, but decompilation. This is basically most of intermediate representation we've been talking about. It's been used and developed specifically to perform decompilations later on. But look on these three different results from uh, either head trace uh, by Linizia and Ghidra. So what is missing here is actually the role, key role of the metadata, which is can change completely the way how the code is looks like. As example, it's literally visible, of course, for experienced traverse engineer, it is a MEM set function. But if you don't have uh, understanding it is actual MEM set from our uh, signature library or whatever heuristics we have in our tooling, so it will be way more complicated code flow, right? Um, in the same time, basically, um, this is just a MEM set. It's a simple function, but think about more complex functions. And this is, shows how metadata can change the way of the code representation and how we actually reading and understanding this code. Another thing, it is uh, diversity of modern runtimes, right? This is a goal length, and I would say decompiling and analyzing the goal length code in many cases, it is a disaster. And basically, of course, like uh, bad actors, threat actors, they try to actually uh, use this approaches to trick the detection tooling and it goes about all the modern runtimes we have more and more compilers we have uh, more programming languages and tools use it in development but at the same time it's don't benefit the industry from the perspective of analyzing this program intros introspecting this program and actually create an effective way of explainability of this code so, basically, we need to think from the perspective, yes, the compilation will exist, but it's a useful tool to benefit us with more high-level representation, but at the same time, we can't uh, get disconnected from assembly code, because otherwise, we will be just to look on the, some abstracted layer of the code representation, which is, can be wrong, it can be... Um, disconnected from the reality because maybe the compiler being uh, providing some uh, misleading transformations. So it's exactly why we need both worlds. And I think uh, it's been a big belief of some of the people from cybersecurity industry when the first decompilers came up saying like, oh, we, know, we don't need more to learn from assembly language, we can get to new abstraction layer. It will be simplify the cost of creating the detections and explainability of the code. But it is not true. So we need, we still need to dive deep into root of cause. But in the same time, we can use a different abstraction to simplify and maybe creating a mindset quicker about some of the things during our analysis. So I think closing this chapter about malware analysis and moving to vulnerability research, I want to talk about the problems uh, and challenges for research probably will be important to solve. One of them is actually utilizing more data flow analysis. I really believe we've been focusing a lot on the control flow and uh, missing uh, actual power of data flow in many cases and data semantics, which is actually can augment, as example, machine learning in, in many cases. Another thing, actually, it's data and uh, code reconstructions. Um, like during program analysis, reverse engineering or whatever automation, we generate a lot of data. And this data need to be stored in specific way when we can 
use it, we can come back or we can uh, use such results for uh, uh, complementary to augment other tooling. And I think the data lock approach, it's very important in these cases, but we don't have the right uh, like storage or database uh, for representations of data. Because as example, uh, the concept uh, which is currently exists, it's very memory consuming and it's not really suitable for the industry. I think it's very important problem to focus on, not only how we producing the results of our analysis, but how we store them and uh, how we um, uh, can come back to this data retrospectively. And uh, last one, but not least, uh, machine learning models and code semantics. I think uh, code semantics, it's been kind of like a missed in many cases. And uh, we are talking a lot about code detections, but uh, not many um, useful approaches. I see how we can actually augment these models with code semantics. And if you think about more knowledge about the code will be make these detections more explainable and more actionable. It's super important topic to focus on. But let's move on vulnerability research. It's another very important topic. And my personal experience on vulnerability research has been always more around firmware and hardware and silicon. Yeah, it's one of the screenshots from my old lab. So it's a real um, GPU research going on. But also, in the same time, it is uh, um, repeatable failures in the industry when uh, vendors not applying the fixes correctly or they can't scope the right size of the problem for their devices, and it's still uh, vulnerable even after the problems are known. It's why we need to dive deeper into explainability on the code, right? As example, this Perfect example, last year we presented a Black Hat and we just for fun double check the fixes on HP machines and surprisingly 30% of uh, machines even released in the same year of this research, it's been unpatched. So, and it's kind of a, like an enterprise grade PCs which is, should be fixed and some of the servers. Yeah, it's been a variety of the problems we found for our Black Hat research. Later on, we found even more and presented at LabsCon and even more for <laughs> EcoPlyTe. But important takeaway from all these three slides, basically the size of the problem we really underestimate. So uh, uh, our group of researchers uh, from Binary reported over 200 uh, high impact vulnerabilities for the last year. I don't think, um, at least publicly, uh, any company commit uh, for uh, such high number of the vulnerabilities reported for the firmware. But thing is, basically, even after we reported a lot of similar vulnerabilities to the vendors, they keep producing vulnerable code. The question is why? And it's no clear answer, but I think I have some hypothesis. And this hypothesis, it's about the context. First of all, it's lack of knowledge base of specific firmware vulnerabilities. And the second, it is about tooling. So most of the tooling are not focused on the firmware code. Most of the tooling are focused on more high level code, as example, even source code analysis tooling. And um, sometimes they can find the obvious problems but they don't see the problems which is very specific to firmware domain. And it's exactly why it happened, right? Because when you look to the firmware, it's something very complex in many cases. It's connected to the hardware, sometimes even to the silicon level, but you need to find the dependencies, you need to find the right mindset, how you can uh, scope these problems. And uh, basically, the number of vulnerabilities are growing mainly because of the complexity and the lack of automation uh, doesn't help the industry to re recover from that. 
right? The researcher can find this problem. And uh, actually, these problems in many cases are not unique and they are repeatable. So um, when uh, uh, we've been trying to automate our uh, research work, uh, first of all, uh, we've been focusing, because of the firmware specifics, we've been focusing a lot on the static analysis, right? And the static analysis basically uh, in many cases are limited. And we've been trying to understand how we can actually extract uh, the most of the value from the static analysis. And uh, most of limitations of existing approaches, it's been focused on uh, false positives, right? Because it's been some heuristics built, and these heuristics are being based on specific hypotheses, and these hypotheses can be very broad and cause a lot of issues, where you need to go case per case to manually understand if it is a real problem or not. And then, uh, basically, the limitation of this approach is uh, kind of shift our mindset to uh, semantic properties and uh, some of the specific lightweight code pattern checkers when it can scope the problem uh, and gain more precision to detect these problems. So we developed uh, some custom intermediate representation form uh, based on the Gidra P code when we basically leave to our custom SSA form and the lightweight hackers, first, of course, it's been semantic annotations, which is augment our uh, lightweight uh, uh, static checkers to basically detect such things. And uh, um, original work, uh, which is actually inspired our research, it's the reference on the slide in the bottom, it's actually been based on LVM intermediate representation but instead of perform lifting uh, and control flow recovery on LVM, we've been uh, using our custom form. I will talk about it a bit later. Yeah, it's how it works. And boom, we can detect some of the issues. Um, I will talk about this particular bug a bit later, a few slides later, but how intermediate uh, representation lifting up works. So basically we are uh, creating, um, uh, we are lifting the code directly to the P code and then actually creating a custom SSA transformation to have uh, uh, some sort of like a uh, extra metadata from uh, from the from the intermediate representation in this SSA form, and uh, then uh, we use semantic annotations to actually annotate intermediate representation with additional information about the types and some of the information from our plugin called Yeefy Explorer. And this has helped us to identify the entry points and uh, basically identify interconnection between some of the abstraction layers into Yeefy firmware. Um, so binary static checkers, it's exactly about the scoping of the problem, right? So we're creating some sort of constraint when uh, we're using uh, control flow properties and data flow properties and connect them together in some domain-specific annotations. And uh, basically, the last phase, it is about under-constrained symbolic execution so basically, uh, um, the work which is uh, citing on the top, uh, I've been done at Intel, and we developed the framework called Excite when we built some symbolic execution on top of uh, silicon simulation. Um, at the time, we've been using Simix, and uh, of course, we don't have any sort of simulation environment, and we try to use limited emulator and argument uh, with the static analysis tooling we are building, build. So, and uh, 
here is a box we've been finding with just a few of the cases. So this is uh, pre fi phase vulnerabilities. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, UFI firmware, but pre fi it's very early boot process, and actually it's very sensitive, trusted boundaries because system management more and later phases are not built or created or set yet. So a lot of hardware specific uh, protections are set in this environment and any bug can be very impactful and powerful. Another bug in pre -fi and um, uh, also uh, interestingly, uh, even known problems still can be unfixed in many cases and also detecting known vulnerabilities at scale, it's another problem for the industry as well. So um, yeah, this is vulnerability. We already been uh, see the demo, but it's more about like um, explain what this vulnerability is. Basically the COM buffer, it's kind of like a buffer which is controlled from user mode. It's passing to specific code flow callback function called is my handler into the firmware and basically in this case it's gains a code execution on system management mode pretty privileged mode on x86 systems which is has a direct access to the physical memory come back to intermediate presentation in many cases um, we can automate uh, during uh, our static analysis process um, detections of such of the problems. This is just an example of detecting get variable and get variable it's pretty useful uh, it's pretty large attack surface in terms of availability on every single uh, UEFI firmware and what get set variable it stands for it's actually communicating with non-volatile memory called invariant right and uh, it exists on every single computer, even on ARM-based, uh, which is uh, using UEFI firmware. And some of the bugs with the get variable, they are cross-platform. Basically, we found the bug, and the same bug being exists on Qualcomm uh, and x86 CPUs, which is funny. Because they've been developed uh, by uh, some... So basically, it is a reference code in this firmware come from Qualcomm, Intel, or AMD, but also intermediate layer of this code developed by independent third party called independent bias developers like Insight, American Megatrans, Phoenix, and they are has the generic frameworks and exactly in this level we can find cross-platform bugs if uh, the same uh, class of the bugs can be exist on both worlds or even more. So. And uh, also, um, you come back to intermediate presentation. Um, I think learning from directly from the code, it's not really a useful way. And building the machine learning models uh, into, uh, into assembly or like a byte sequences as to work, it's not effective because it's missing semantics but using intermediate representation to augment your machine learning models, it actually can be a very um, interesting and robust way to build uh, uh, detections or discovery of vulnerabilities and actually add some explainability. But similarity search is actually one of the main drivers for, um, for the binary diffing, right? And um, at the same time, it's probably as the most obvious way where machine learning can help. Uh, surprisingly, the state of the art of binary diffing is still being diff. I think uh, the first uh, bin diff versions, it's been around 2004, 2005. And dynamics, of course, pioneered for the industry binary diffing from the perspective of actually reverse engineering the patches and fixes. Of vulnerabilities but I think um, we still don't have anything better than that so at least on the commercial tooling broadly available right 
And uh, similarity search, it's extremely important. So as example, uh, one of um, the research we conducted last year when after discovery of Moonbound's new five firmware implant, we realized actually uh, our code similarity tools uh, showing way more metadata than actually explaining it into the blog. As example, uh, this is uh, the result of our uh, code similarity tool where it's augmented with the behavioral. So basically, it adds some of the functionality about explaining what type of the behavioral in this code and what type of um, changes are being triggered. And why machine learning is actually a useful concept for binary diffing from the perspective of um, uh, comparing one binary file to one, you can just use bin like a bin diff, right? Just one to one, it's not that difficult. But what if you have few thousands of the similar binaries and then you need to compare it to one? How much compute it will be cost in the cloud? I think it, it will be actually very expensive iterations of binary diffing. But at the same time, what if we build the machine learning model to compare one to many? This is a very interesting problem to focus on and um, to solve. But let's look from the practical perspective, how we can apply this to finding some anomalies or finding some real cases of firmware implants or firmware security failures. Um, this is a demo of the tool we built for exactly approach to compare one firmware image to many. And it is basically uh, going to learn from the binary which we are giving as an input and then use TCNA algorithm for find um, some outliers from the baseline. So basically, after this analysis are finished, um, the takeaway, it will be about where the problem are scoped. And uh, you can see on the right side of the screen, one particular outlier where one of security features on this machine is being weirdly disabled. And uh, basically, it's caused us uh, enough data to scope the machine where the implant being actually deployed. It's a real uh, world case, but I can't provide more information, unfortunately, yet. So, and um, also, um, this is how we use explainability of such uh, uh, code similarity detection with our internal tooling to actually understand where exactly uh, this triggers and uh, also the same tooling helping us to improve our models. And the last topic I really want to talk about because firmware implants and uh, supply chain and uh, vulnerabilities all connected and uh, industry developed the topic, uh, not topic, but thing called uh, software bill of materials. Software bill of materials, it's very beautiful concept for the open source world. When we can scope all the dependencies and uh, uh, see them, but on proprietary software, we need to trust the vendors and we need to trust the information they are providing. But these vendors has other dependencies and other dependencies and other dependencies. And it's very difficult and complicated problem when this s bone can be failing because we just can't validate or trace uh, completely all the components from proprietary software, right? So it's exactly about like having the closed box compared to open box with an open source software. One of the beautiful examples we discovered at Binary when we try to analyze if 
Um, how many open cell LPNSSL versions used by wild single U5 firmware? And we realized it's actually can we go up to 13, up to eight, depends on the vendor and more. And some of uh, the OpenSSL versions on the components from the vendors like Infineon, uh, which is responsible for the TPM modules, are not up to date for 10 plus years, right? It's basically more than a hundred critical vulnerabilities combining together sitting in this OpenSSL. Maybe not all of them exploitable in this particular context, but it's enough to actually break in the security completely. I think uh, come back to the topic and focus on the next directions for vulnerability research and uh, for vulnerability research automation, it's very important to think about how we detect not only unknown problems, but known vulnerabilities and also how we can scope unknown ones based on existing knowledge. I would call them known unknowns when the class of the problems are known, but we still can detect them or can see them at scale. Another thing it's about how we can actually uh, try us and uh, explain our findings from the fuzzing more effectively. One of the topics today morning, it's been exactly about that. And uh, this is why it's resonated the question about like, okay, right now we're producing more crashes than actually we can analyze, can triage and prioritize, but how we can make it better, how we can actually uh, understand and be more proactive uh, for critical problems, how we can scope them and uh, fix them. And uh, third one, um, for me, it's about machine learning models guided by the code semantics to automate actually uh, findings of known vulnerabilities or known unknowns. So this is possible, and I think the code semantics, it is a key, but we need to do better on the both worlds in academia and industry. And as a closing, uh, one of the closing slides, basically uh, we have, we've been uh, earlier in 2000s using artificial intelligence as a black box to solve some problem for cybersecurity. And now cybersecurity came to machine learning models, right? So we need to actually focus on how we can protect the machine learning models, how we can um, validate them, make them explainable and not a black box, right? How we can make the machine learning models not being inferred with the wrong data. It's a lot of open questions. I think this is one of the challenges nowadays in the research areas when it's um, very, I think every single uh, cybersecurity vendor saying they're using machine learning for something, but at the same time, if you ask about explainability of their models, these questions will be most likely not asked or turn into some different directions. So every tool, it's not a silver bullet. Uh, Machine learning and artificial intelligence, it's not exception. We need to apply such approaches where it is applicable and where it is help us. It's not like we need to take some tool and use it everywhere, right? It's not like you can build the house only with a hammer, right? Same thing about machine learning. And I think that's pretty much it from my end uh, on my keynote. Thank you so much for uh, giving me the stage to discuss these topics and I open for the questions. I won't uh, ask you any questions about the, the great, uh, any, if there's anything better than Bindiff uh, out there. But uh, I was kind of interested in um, your uh, binary lifting intermediate language. Um, you said that you uh, 
He said that you created your own intermediate language. Um, why, and why did you uh, feel that there was it was necessary to do that, and why couldn't you uh, extend already existing intermediate representations? Thank you so much. This is a great question. And uh, we actually created the custom as a safe form, which is transformed on some custom intermediate representation, but it's being transformed from Gidra Picot. So basically, we don't try to invent the bicycle. <laughs> it's already more real, it's already invented. We try to reduce the best, what is suitable for our uh, research and uh, products and uh, the challenges we try to solve. Uh, and actually, I went with some new ideas we found useful. Thank you. But if I will be looking in the immediate representation direction, probably for me, uh, the most comprehensive one is binary media. So, which is, at least for the pro binary problem analysis, it's one of the best, I believe. And building automation on top of it is. Uh, way more easier compared to some others. Uh, th thanks for the talk. I, it's, it's really uh, enlightening. me. Um, so uh, I'm quite curious about, actually, I, I really agree with you that uh, the semantics matters a lot. Uh, however, you know, uh, industry-wise, people also care about performance, uh, especially when, you, for example, you uh, you are doing a uh, like malware detection. You, you, you don't want the, the, the customers to wait too, too long. So, so I, I'm very curious about how much performance overhead would this uh, lifting uh, introduce to like just uh, analyzing the, the, the assembly code directly or say you know, that, that kind of uh, performance so overhead. In our case, for 16 megabyte of the firmware, it didn't take up to five seconds to analyze it. So, but basically, Come back to your question about the semantics. Of course, if you augment all the semantics from the binary, it will be actually uh, create a lot of metadata, which will be take time to analyze. So you need to find the balance. You need to scope the metadata and semantics really useful for particular detections. So or finding the problems in vulnerability research. You don't need all of them. You need specific ones. Thanks. Thank you. 
made a case against it or reason? Can you explain us what you are thinking about this aspect? Uh, absolutely. Probably it will be one of the topics of my future talks. And uh, uh, I agree. So we need to build these feedback loops. And uh, thank you so much for this question. Silicon dependencies, which is can be resolved with 
uh, you wait or you don't have enough knowledge because this functionality is undocumented, right? And it's uh, proprietary by the vendor. So this is okay, some challenges, but uh, I don't think it is unsolvable when you can scope uh, correctly the problem you try to find or to solve. Of course, in general way, uh, you can't avoid the program, but as example, 